Barbara and I are very pleased to be with you this weekend uh, for several reasons. There are some of you whom we've known for a long time, including your pastor and her spouse. Uh, we have known some others of you. Keith hinted at that from your time in Walla Walla, where we live. And we have been delighted already to get acquainted with several of you uh, last night and again now today. It's a good weekend for us to think about the themes that we are uh, pointed toward. The notion of Black History Month and the, the idea of forgiveness. Fitting those two things together might seem a bit strange to you. Let me try to do it in this way. Black History Month is one of those variety of events through the calendar of, in our country that reminds us of how fortunate we are to live in a diverse society. Variations and differences enrich us. They give us insight that we might not have gotten if we lived in our own little narrow family or neighborhood, if we isolated ourselves from other people, tried to make everybody a homogenous, uh, same sort of person in a society, we would lose the interest of variety. The, the music today illustrates that to me. I don't know whether you have ever seen this variety of instruments gathered to play together, but it was a unique blend, wasn't it? Three brass instruments, a harp. Macy, I had forgotten that you played the harp. And a, an oboe and a bassoon, my goodness. Unique, interesting things. And a style of music which some of us are not used to, but our willingness to try makes life more intriguing. It enriches us. It complements one another. Unfortunately, in our world, things don't always go well when we bring diverse points of view, diverse backgrounds together, do they? We are haunted regularly in the news with the suffering that's gone on in the Ukraine with the battles that continue in the Middle East, with the struggles we almost lose sight of in Africa, with the racial and sexual tensions that exist in countries around the world, with the religious conflicts that drive and push us. It's very difficult for us to, to keep together to be unified while we are at the same time so diverse. How we cope with those times when harmony doesn't exist intrigues me. And that's why I chose as our story to look at this morning this event from the life of Jesus described in the book of Mark. For here we find a, a small group of people who intend to be speaking the same message, writing from the same page, if you will, wanting to all be supportive of the cause in which, to which they had committed themselves. And, and yet we see at the climax of Jesus' life the splintering and disintegration of that sense of cohesion and unity. And my, um, my question for you to have in the back of your minds as we remind ourselves of this story today is how is it that those who were betrayed, that Jesus, who was deserted, coped with this splintering of the community around him? And how is it that those 
who did not live up to their expectations of supporting and maintaining that cohesion, how is it that they coped with their participation in undermining the very cause to which they had committed themselves? And I will suggest to you that forgiveness is the foundation that brings them all back together in the end. So we start with Mark's sharing of the story. All four of the Gospels predict Peter's betrayal of Jesus. I choose Mark for our scripture reading because most commentators believe that Mark, who would have been very young at the time Jesus was going through these experiences, probably didn't experience these events himself, but he heard about them, particularly from Peter himself. So if we're going to pick a storyteller to choose the one who heard from Peter about the story of Peter makes some sense to me, okay? So on this night, the disciples have been together. Jesus has predicted what's going to happen to him. He has alerted the disciples that what their plans had been for Jesus to take over as an earthly ruler are disappearing. And he urged them to prepare for what lay ahead. I think when Jesus made this prediction that Mark records about the disciples all deserting Jesus, and Peter jumps up and quickly pledges his undying loyalty to Jesus. Even if I have to die, I will not betray you, Peter says. At that moment, Peter no doubt had all kinds of ways to prepare to stay true to his commitment. How was it that he could best be a supporter of Jesus and not undermine Jesus in the hours ahead? I even wonder, I, I, I'm anxious to have this, any question you want to ask, a time with Peter. Did you, in the Garden of Gethsemane, go to sleep instead of pray like Jesus asked? Did you go to sleep because you, as a man who was a physical laborer, knew that if you were not well rested, your body did not perform well? And you figured you were going to have to fight, so is that why you were resting, sleeping, getting ready for the battle to come? We know that Peter carried a weapon with him, had that ready, and in fact, when the onslaught of the enemy came, Peter went to work. You remember that? And in fact, before even Jesus could intervene, Peter had severed an ear from those who were approaching his master. How mystified he must have been when Jesus interrupted his plan. That's enough, Peter, Jesus said. That's enough. And where Peter had destroyed, Jesus reconstructed. Where Peter had cut off the ear, Jesus healed it again. So Peter's first attempt to follow through on his commitment to be loyal to Jesus, to maintain unity, to be a cohesive um, defense parameter around his master. G uh, Peter's first attempt of confrontation, battle, Jesus himself put aside. So what does Peter do next? From the Garden of Gethsemane, the, the, the apostles tell us that the disciples, almost all of them, did exactly what Jesus had predicted and ran away, deserted Jesus. Peter did not. He followed Jesus 
and the mob into town, into the courtyard of the high priest, where for hours during that night, Jesus was questioned, confronted, threatened. The end, the inevitable end was on the way. But Peter was loyal. He was there. He was going to prove that this cause meant enough to him that he would not desert the Lord himself. But in order to stay there, he went into his plan B, which was to try to blend in so that no one would recognize him as different from everybody else. He wanted to pretend that he was one of them instead of one with Jesus. He wanted to blur the distinctions among them. Have you ever <clears throat> been in a place where you wish you could hide your identity? Where being a woman or being a man or being a white man or being a, an educated person or a laborer or an Adventist or a Christian or an American was a liability and not a plus? where you wish you could change your identity and just be one with everybody around you? I see some of your heads saying, yes, I know what that feels like. That happened to me decades ago. I was headed to Europe for a year of school. It was during the Vietnam War. And Americans were not held in high esteem by Europeans at that time. In fact, there was a book that had been published not long before that called The Ugly American. We were seen as being warmongers, invading other people's countries, messing around in things that were none of our business. We were perceived to be uh, uncouth, crass, unrefined, uneducated, undignified people. So when I landed in a layover in London, uh, I decided to try to act as much like a Brit as I could. I, pra had, I practiced my accent. Um, I tried to dress and walk and act like a proper British gentleman. I was standing at a bus stop waiting for a bus, umbrella over my arm, trying to stand rather dignified, you know, being a bit uh, discreet about conversation. And a man standing with me fell into conversation with me. And after a while, he said, what part of Britain are you from? I said to myself, whoa, this is working. The guy doesn't know who I am. I got on the bus. He got off at another stop, came to where I needed to uh, get off of the bus myself. I got off, umbrella over my arm, started to walk down the street, you know. And a guy came up from behind me, had not been on the bus, hadn't seen me before came up behind me, tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, what part of the States are you from? <laughs> Shattered my attempt to hide my identity. I said, how do you know? He said, oh, I can tell by the way you walk. <laughs> we just can't hide our true selves, can we? Peter had that trouble that night. And even though he attempted three different times to deny his affiliation with Jesus. He was caught. And then the rooster crowed. I wish we had a video we could play of that moment. Can you imagine what it must have been like for Peter in the dark of that courtyard to hear the rooster at the first glimmer of light crow into the 
early morning air and have Jesus look right straight at you. You had not done what you had committed yourself to do. The two plans you had prepared in, in your mind, the, the, the way to attack this battle, confrontation and infiltration, neither one of those had worked. You were a failure at this. And then Jesus looks at you, this one whom you wish to be in unity with, and you knew you were the cause of his pain. We don't know how it happened, but I imagine Peter stumbling out into the quiet streets of that very early morning. Hopes dashed, self-image bottomed out, maybe flailing his arms in despair and wishing he were able to do what he had promised God he could do. And then I imagine his arm slapping his leg, and instead of hitting the soft flesh of his thigh, he feels his weapon. And we don't know if it's true, but I wonder if Peter may not have considered using that on himself. How could he imagine going back into that circle of people to whom he had thought he committed his life, and now he betrayed them? How could he imagine facing Jesus again when he was the cause of Jesus being deserted and alone? But because the story went on beyond that, something must have called Peter back from the depths of his discouragement and the pain of his despair. And I suspect it was a phrase embedded in Jesus' message that predicted Peter's betrayal. Evidently, Peter didn't notice it at the time. None of the disciples commented on it. Uh, the apostles didn't mention it at all. Did you notice it? You will all fall away, Jesus said to them, for it's written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, and so on went Peter's pushing back at that message. What a strange sentence for Jesus to include. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. What did he mean by that? Why would he describe what was going to happen after the betrayal? Oh. The betrayal was not going to be the end. Jesus was not going to reject them. He was not going to desert them. He wanted to be with them again. And in John chapter 21, we find the story of that reconciliation. It was not easy. It was not peaceful. It was embarrassing for Peter. Three times in front of everybody else, Jesus asked Peter if he loved him, you remember? And the third time, John says that Peter was hurt, that Jesus kept asking them this question. I can imagine it must have been humiliating for Peter, this self-sufficient, strong man, to have... his inner failure opened up in front of his colleagues.
But what did Jesus do at that time before confronting Peter with himself? When you read the story this afternoon or this week when you get to it, you'll be reminded that Jesus was on the shore of the Sea of Galilee fixing breakfast for them on the beach. So what does Jesus, the one who was abused and misused, the one who was deserted by those who could have been his advocates, what does Jesus do with us when we fail? He cooks a barbecue on the beach and asks us to come and eat with him. He welcomes us back into the circle of his friendship and reconnects us with him and with one another. Not a bad message for a fragmented world at a tumultuous time in our history that Jesus becomes the rallying point that calls us to identify with our heritage, to accommodate our failures, to be graceful and merciful toward those who fail themselves to live up to what they wish and our expectations of them, to reconcile with those from whom we are estranged, and to find a way through Jesus' example, to forgive one another as God has forgiven us. Let us pray. Lord God, we are both at fault and hurt. We are the wounded and the perpetrators. I pray that you will speak to each of us in the way we need to hear your voice and bring healing and hope and health to our church families, our communities, and our world through whom Jesus is to us. Amen.